Hey you folks, Quilly Dean here and welcome to another episode of our guide to Kerbal Space Program for complete beginners. And we are back due to popular demand. A lot of people have requested a couple more of these beginner style tutorials for some somewhat more advanced stuff. And today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going to the moon. Oh, I thought, I guess the moon's somewhere else right now. That's oh, on the other side of Kerbin, which is actually kind of what we're hoping for right now. So to follow along with this tutorial, you're going to need to get some sort of ship in orbit around Kerbin, which by this point you should know how to do. This is the vessel that I will be bringing to the moon. I have packed on here a variety of scientific experiments, including the newly unlocked SC9001 Science Junior. I have some amount of fuel, and I have a Terrier engine on here. The Terrier engines are very fuel efficient in space. They don't push quite as hard, but they'll go a lot further on the same amount of fuel that another engine will do. So you can you can come around with whatever you would like over here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bop back down to the Space Center temporarily, just show you what science I unlocked to get to this point. Just a scooch more than in the previous video. So if we go to Research and Development over here, you can see that I've got Advanced Rocketry. That unlocked the Terrier engine for me, as well as the, uh, the somewhat larger fuel tank over here, again, to save on some parts. I've unlocked the Stability Tech over here, which was very cheap, and the main reason I did it is to unlock the radial decoupler. I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. And finally down here, I unlocked basic science because it unlocks the SC9001 Science Junior. There's a new science experiment. Every science experiment you unlock means you can get more science, which means you can unlock new technologies faster. It also gave me access to some batteries, which I did use on my ship. Probably isn't required, but better safe than sorry. If we check mission control over here, I have uh, not taken the contract, there we go, explore the moon. This is the contract we're looking to complete today. Um, and so we will show you how to do a flyby of the moon. However, we're also gonna be talking about uh, two other major concepts. We're gonna be looking at the other directions on the nav ball that aren't prograde and retrograde. We're gonna be talking about radial and anti-radial, which we mentioned a little, um, in our orbit video. We're also going to be looking at normal and anti-normal uh, and those other directions in the nav ball and how they're useful. We're also going to be looking at more advanced manipulation of science that's on your ship, including doing some stuff outside of your spaceship with your astronaut, which is quite cool. So, Explore the Moon, that's the only contract I'm looking to complete today. Again, it's great if you can complete more contracts than I'm doing here. I'm just trying to do the bare bones minimum to show you um, how little you need to do. Obviously, the more science you unlock, the more tech you have access to, the easier everything begin becomes, but we're gonna be just fine like this. So let me go and show you the ship that I built to get me here. It is called the, uh, I think it's the Mooner Flyby Mark One that I used. Yeah, there it is. So you can see the top of my ship over here. This is the same thing if I remove that. This is the bit that's currently in orbit. So starting from the bottom, very similar to before, except I have used the radial decouplers over here to go and attach two solid fuel boosters to the side. Instead of having one SRB underneath my stack using a stack decoupler, I'm putting a pair of them on each side to get a little bit more oomph at takeoff. These radial decouplers work exactly the same as stack decouplers, except they mount on the side of your ship. And then when they unleash, they pop off like this. And that's all. Uh, let me undo that and go back over here. So that's it. So we start in, in my ship that I built. And you don't have to copy the same design, but we've got a pair of SRBs that light first. Then they get decoupled over here and we light our main engine. Um, then at some point that stage runs out. And ideally at that point, we are in space or at least the very high atmosphere because this engine is bad in the atmosphere. Um, especially at, at, like at sea level where the air is very thick. This engine is very poor. But once you get into the upper atmosphere and ideally in space, um, it becomes a little bit more powerful and it becomes very fuel efficient. So I used a little bit of fuel from this stage over here, a little bit of this fuel to finish our circularization to get into orbit. And the rest of the fuel will be dedicated to getting to the moon and back. Again, I did unlock this new science experiment here, the SC9001 Material Bay. Notice that it is below my decoupler. You don't have to do this. The Material Bay is actually quite expensive. If we take a look at the science screen over here, the Material Bay costs 1,800 uh, Kerbal bucks. So it's fairly pricey and you might want to return to it with it, return to Kerbin with it still, you know, as part of your, your final recovery stage. Uh, but I decided to move it down here for two reasons. One, it will make returning a little easier and lighter. And two, because 
um, it's going to force us to showcase some EVA science manipulation, which is going to be quite nice. So this is the thing I took into orbit. So let's, uh, don't need to save this. I'm just going to pop back to my ship. So at this point, feel free to uh, pause the video and get yourself some sort of ship in orbit. I'm going to select my Mooner flyby over here from the, the tracking center, and I'm going to go ahead and fly it. Now, we're going to do this trip to the moon um, with no upgrades to our tracking station or to mission control. This is actually going to make things a little bit trickier because um, upgrading those two buildings will give us a variety of extra tools that make planning our trip in space a lot easier. And for the next video, which is going to involve landing on... Actually, I think instead of landing on the moon, we might land on Minmus just because it tends to be a lot easier to land on first, although you don't usually get the contracts of this right away. Um, either way, we'll land on one of them. We'll see how it goes. Um, in the next video, we will land on those. And in that video, I'm going to show you what it's like with the upgraded tracking center and the upgraded mission control so that we have things called um, patched conics and we'll have things called maneuver nodes, which will make space travel a lot easier. A lot easier because you'll be able to sort of visualize what goes on a lot more. But here we're going to do things by the seat of our pants. So I'm going to just pause a second here because otherwise uh, the game will progress without me. And the timing's pretty good right now for some stuff. How do we get to the moon? Well, the moon is in orbit around Kerbin. We are also in orbit around Kerbin. The difference is the moon is in a much higher orbit than we are. What we have to do, step one to getting to the moon, is we have to make sure that our orbit is this far away from Kerbin, is as high as the moon. That's that's how we get there. We simply make our orbit bigger so that at some point we reach out over here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a little quick save here. If I were to go to simply face myself prograde, and my Jebediah has enough experience points that I can just lock myself prograde now. Of course, you could just point to it manually. If I do that and I light my engine, what's going to happen? Well, wherever I am, Right? On the opposite side of the orbit, I'm going to raise my apoapsis. Generally speaking, the only way to change the size of your orbit, right, the length of the circle over here, is to burn prograde to make it bigger or retrograde to make it smaller. Those are by far... There's some fuzziness with some other directions, and especially if you're not right on the nodes, that might affect the overall shape of your thing, especially with gravity wells. But generally speaking, prograde orbit bigger, retrograde, orbit smaller. The other two directions that we're going to talk about a little bit later, which is the radial and normal, mostly just spin and change the direction of your orbit rather than change the size. So if we burn here, we stretch out our apoapsis more and more. Notice it even goes faster and faster and faster and faster. And that's what we do. So I quick saved right before doing this because I want to show the example. So what we want to do is we are going to want to burn prograde in such a way that we'll raise one side of our orbit, and as soon as we start bur making that burn, that other side of the orbit will quickly become the apoapsis, the highest point of our orbit. So at some point, our apoapsis will get stretched far enough that it is going to encounter, it's going to be at the same height as the moon's orbit over here. Now, so you might think, ah, so what we have to do is say, let's say we put the moon at 12 o'clock over here, which means that if we go to 6 o'clock right here, and burn prograde, then what it's going to do, it's going to stretch out our orbit, and eventually it'll reach the moon over here. Well, I mean, what will happen is, yes, you will stretch out your orbit, and it will reach over here, and at some point your ship will follow the path of your orbit, and at some point your ship will arrive over here. By the time you arrive over here, though, the moon will no longer be here. The moon's going to be somewhere over here, because the moon is orbiting around Kerbin. It's going to take us a certain amount of time to travel over here, and in that time, the moon will have moved. So what you have to do is you have to figure out what, how far is the moon going to travel around Kerbin in the time it's going to take for us to go up that high. It's going to be some amount. Now, if you don't know, you can actually just sort of blindly do it one time, right? Imagine you quick saved. You raised your orbit, so your, your apoapsis was, say, leave the moon at 12 o'clock, raise your orbit straight up to there. By the time you get there, the moon will be somewhere over here. But then you can look at that kind of distance and say, ah, that's how far the moon will travel. So if the moon's over here, then what I have to do is, instead of burning at 6 o'clock, I'll have to burn somewhere around here. 
That way, when I raise my apoapsis, the apoapsis will be here, and by the time I reach there, the moon will have arrived at the same place. So you can just figure that out by doing a test run one time. It's totally okay. There's also some websites that will give you uh, specific information as to the optimal spots for those sorts of burns as well. Once we unlock maneuver nodes, we'll be able to um, very easily sort that stuff out for the moon and minas as well. But it turns out there's a nice handy dandy little trick for the moon. Um, because the moon will indeed end up around here. That's about how far it'll travel. And so it turns out that the sweet spot to burn is if the moon's at 12 o'clock, we indeed want to go and start our burn somewhere around here. Somewhere around here is where we want to start our burn because we'll arrive at the right spot. It just sort of turns out, by coincidence, that, think about it, here's the moon. The moon is currently behind the planet from where we are, right? It's behind Kerbin. But at some point, we're going to end up somewhere over here, and we'll be able to see the moon. We'll see the moon rise above the horizon of Kerbin as we turn around here. And it just so happens that that's the perfect time to start your burn. So you don't need any fancy equipment for your moonshot. All you have to do is make sure you're facing prograde, because we want to make our orbit bigger. So to go bigger, you have to go prograde. And what we're going to do is, I'm just going to time warp a little. You do make sure you quick save before you time warp because it's over to, easy to overshoot. We're just going to, I'm turning my view here so I can peek a little sooner. As soon as I see the moon, oh, stop, 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 whoops. I hit the M key, but there we go. Stop the time warp. The moon has risen. Prograde, full throttle. It just so happens that this works out as a very convenient timing, which means you can do your first moon flyby with basically no upgrades of your ground stations. You don't have to worry about your tracking station being upgraded. You don't have to worry about your um, your mission control being upgraded. All you have to do is wait for the moon to rise and burn prograde. That's it. That's all. Depending on your altitude and depending on exactly how powerful your engine are, there might be more or less sweet spots for, for the moon, but overall this is going to get the job done. So, and remember, we're not, we're not burning towards the moon, we're actually burning towards here. But we're burning prograde, we're extending our orbit out that way, and we're just going to wait until the apoapsis reaches here. Now, it will start going faster and faster, so when it gets close, just hit X to stop the burn, and then use Shift to just burn slowly and stop. That looked, whoops, I hit the wrong button, so I went a little too far. Tell you what. Even though this is actually 100% fine, we'll still encounter the moon. Just for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to turn around and burn retrograde and just bring it down. The moon has an altitude of about 11.4 million, so we want to just bring it down to about the same. There we go. You don't have to do this. It would have been 100% fine. I just want to... There's, there's a particular plan I have for this tutorial. Basically, well, I'll leave that for later. Okay, so at this point, our apoapsis is high enough that it reaches the orbit of the moon. So, assuming we've timed it right, by the time we arrive over here, which I think is going to take us about a day and a half in Kerbin time, by the time we get over here, the moon will have arrived. The uh, The months in the Kerbin system are much shorter than um, in our world. I think the months are something like six or seven days. Um, just like a day on Kerbin is actually only six hours, so all the times are a little bit different. But yeah, by the time we make the long trip over here, the moon will have also made the trip over there, and we should arrive at the same time, which is awesome. Now, we are still slightly off, because unless I was in a perfect equatorial orbit, damn, I was pretty darn close, right? If I had come up a little crooked on my ascent, right? Assuming I, I didn't rise perfectly to the east, I was like east and slightly north, then I would be in an orbit that was going like this around the planet, which means if I burn prograde over here and extend my orbit, my orbit would end up much higher or much lower than the moon. You can see I'm actually slightly below, right? This is where I'm going to end up, and this gray line is the moon's path. Or if we look at it from the side, you can see I'm definitely going to be below the moon. Again, this is way more than close enough to get the job done. But let's say we don't know that, or let's say we're going to be perfectionists. We're like, damn, it would be really nice if we were exactly on the same flat plane as the moon's orbit. Can we do that? Well, that's where the other directions on your nav ball come into play. So, prograde and retrograde make your orbit bigger or smaller. The other two pairs are the blue circle with the arrows pointing out, or on the opposite side, with the arrows pointing in. This is your radial and anti-radial directions. I described that in our orbital video when I said I, I, I mentioned a idea for how we might break orbit and return to Kerbin, I said you might be tempted to point towards the planet, which is 
generally what your, I don't remember if this one's the radial or anti-radial one, but this blue one generally means pointing towards the planet. It's not exactly the case because radial and anti-radial, you should actually almost think of as more of a one's pointing towards the right and one's pointing towards the left. Now, if you're in a circular orbit around a planet, then the one pointing towards the left in this case is going to be pointing towards the planet. But let's say we get out here, radial is actually going to be pointing left in towards this way. Anti-radial is going to point that way or the, the other way around. Again, I don't remember which one's anti and which one's radial. doesn't matter. These two blue circles are left and right. And as I mentioned in my orbit tutorial, what those two tend to do is they don't shrink your circle. What they do is they cause it to pivot. If we were to burn radial or anti-radial right now, where we are now, we would take our entire circle and pivot it around where we are now. So this would all shift towards the left or all shift towards the right. Because of very gravity effects, it's not 100% literally exact, but that's the best way I find to explain it. You shift your entire path left or right without making your circle bigger or smaller. It so happens that that's not the most fuel efficient way to cause your path to intersect the planet. The most fuel efficient way to cause your, your path to intersect the planet is actually to burn radial or anti-radial generally at the apoapsis or periapsis, depending on exactly what you're trying to do here, but left and right. That's not what we're looking for right now. What we're looking for right now is instead the normal and anti-normal vectors, which are the pink triangles, this one, and then again on the opposite side of the nav ball, there's another pink one over here. These are vectors that point up and down, up, down from your plane. Again, so you've got this flat sort of plane described by orbit. Even if we're like way crooked and stuff like that, right? You could still orient your camera in such a way that your, your orbit was making a circle and the normal and anti-normal is always perpendicular to that circle pointing effectively up and down. And this is what you can use to shift your whole orbit up and down. Now, and that's what we want to do here, clearly, um, because we're perfectionists, even though, again, this apoapsis is way close enough that we're going to we're going to be able to encounter the moon. No problem. Uh, we're perfectionists and we would love for this to be brought up to here. So should I burn normal right where I am now or even right where we were on the periapsis? The answer, it turns out, is no, because just as with the radial and anti-radial burns, the best way to think of the normal and anti-normal is to sort of pivot where we are. If we look at ourselves and we sort of like draw a line through the orbit to the other side, when we burn, say we burn upwards, okay, if we burn up right now, what you're actually doing is where we are now, the pivot point doesn't change. What it does is it's like a teeter-totter. This side would go up and the, this side would go down. Or if we burn pointing down, this side would go down and this side would go up. Therefore, the best place to burn to raise this apoapsis is sort of going to be kind of in the middle over here for fuzzy reasons of whatever. There, there are sweet spots. There's ascending, descending node stuff, which we don't have that information for right now. I'm mostly saying this because I know there's someone in the comments who's going to be like, well, that's not exactly true. We're kind of eyeballing things here. You're getting a feel. That's what I'm trying to evoke here is the feel of what this maneuver is supposed to uh, explain. And so therefore, roughly, if we're sort of vaguely halfway, or I tend to do it a little bit earlier because it gives me more time to correct my problems. Um, the, if, you're, if you're not in the perfect sweet spot, it simply is less fuel efficient and things might be a little bit more crooked in other ways. But for our purposes, that's going to be good enough. So let's go ahead. We're going to do a time warp. So we're going to quick save first. I'm going to time warp until I'm about here. And whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe a little bit more. You know what? That feels okay. I'm going to do that, and I'm facing one of these pink triangles. Which one's up? Which one's down? Well, there's actually ways to figure it out, but let's just guess. Let's guess that this is the one I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to line myself up. Um, I guess I can line myself up over here. Actually, that looks pretty good. So I can see my apoapsis, and I want to bring it up. So the question is, pointing at this pink triangle, is it going to send it up or down? I'm going to use one tap of shift and see what happens. It's going to use very little fuel. Oh, I guessed wrong. Look, see, it's going down down. This is, this is bad. This is not what I want. So I'm going to flip to the other side, the other pink triangle, right here. So basically the normal pink triangle is up and the spiky one is down. Although it's, yeah, it's, it's fuzzier than that because of different things, but let's pretend. So in this case, we're at the other pink triangle. So the other one sent us down. So this one will clearly send us up. So one tap of shift. That looks good. 
And I'm just going to let it burn until it's basically flat. Look at that. So now we're really going on the same plane as the moon. Now, depending on where you do that normal and anti-normal burn, it might result in a little bit of twist this way, which you can see that we've got a little bit of twisting going on here. It's okay. This is going to be very satisfying. So we're basically going to hit this line dead on, and that feels great. Okay, so let's see what happens. What's next? Well, we're going to do another big time warp because it's going to take us a while for us to rendezvous over here. So we're going to quick save. Then we're going to start our time warp by tapping the period key here. Now, at some point, what's going to happen, you see our orbit right now is being described as an orbit around Kerbin. At some point, we're going to get so close to the moon that the moon's gravity will become more important than Kerbin's gravity. We will have changed our sphere of influence. At that point, instead of describing our path as an orbit around Kerbin, it's going to describe our path as an orbit around the moon. Well, we're not going to be in a true orbit, but we'll get to that in a second. So we're just waiting for this line to, to break, to change. Be ready to stop your time warp. Be ready. It's going to happen very soon here. Very, very, very soon. I promise. I promise. There. Stop, 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 stop. Excellent. We are close enough to the moon that the moon's gravity is now the most important thing there is, rather than Kerbin. Now, in reality, in reality, all the bodies in, well, literally the entire universe are exerting some gravitational force. So in reality, if we were here, Kerbin's gravity would still be something we care about. In Kerbal Space Program, though, and in, in fact, in any computer situation, simulation, doing multiple bodies which all affect each other is actually a really problematic thing. Um, so in Kerbal, you actually are only affected by one thing's gravity at a time, but it turns out that's still pretty darn close to reality. So anyway, it means we don't have to worry about Kerbin. We only have to worry about the moon's gravity. The problem is this. We are so, we were so on target with the moon, which is something I did intentionally here to like showcase things. We are so on target with the moon that what, what's going to be happening? Yep. That's, that's pretty much right on target with the moon. We are, we're not going to be doing a lunar flyby. We're going to be a, doing a lunar, hey, let's create a new crater. We're going to smack directly into the moon, given our current path over here. And that's something we clearly need to fix. Now, one way to think about this is to imagine that what's the lowest point in our quote unquote orbit around the moon at this point, right? What is our periapsis? Well, the periapsis is somewhere inside the moon. And so you might think, ah, what I have to do is raise the periapsis to get it from outside the moon. And yeah, I guess that's that's sort of true. Uh-huh, absolutely. Now, where's the best place to raise the periapsis? Well, we want to do that on the opposite side of the orbit, ideally. So at the apoapsis. The problem is the apoapsis is, in some sense, infinitely far away that way. If we were to burn prograde here, we would really not be raising the periapsis at all. We'd be raising whatever's on the effective opposite side of our orbit from where we are, which isn't even here. It's somewhere, again, sort of infinitely off the other side. Burning prograde doesn't help us. In fact, think very much about what it means to burn prograde. It means we are be burning in the direction that we're moving. What direction are we moving? Um, we're moving in that direction. So by burning prograde, we would in fact be burning directly towards the moon. Similarly, burning retrograde doesn't help us because while it does burn us directly opposite the moon, and slow us down, it's not changing our direction. What we need to do at this point is we need to move this vector. We don't need to make our orbit bigger or smaller. We need to move this path. And what's the best way to do that? Well, eyeballing things, I would say the best way to do this would be to move this path to the left. Burning radial or anti-radial. I, I think in this case it would be radial. Um, we would burn that way, causing our orbit to pivot around us, right? Which would shove this line leftwards. The line behind us would get shoved rightwards, but that's okay. So this would get shoved leftward until at some point we'd likely miss the moon instead of smacking directly into it. So in this case, that's it. We could also, if we wanted to, burn normal or anti-normal if we wanted to um, miss the moon on the north side or the south side. Perfectly fine. Now, there is a bit of optimization as to whether you burn left or right. Now, here I would think burning left because we're already kind of on the left side of our orbit here. So burning left is probably going to need a little bit less fuel to dodge the moon. Whereas if we burn to the right, because we'll have to sort of invert all this, most likely we'll need a little bit more fuel to dodge the moon. But they're still worth considering both sides because depending on what side of the moon we end up on, when we 
fly past the moon, we're going to we're going to escape the moon again. We're not currently setting ourselves up to be orbiting the moon. We're going to be still zooming past the moon and then we'll escape the moon and we'll be back in orbit around Kerbin at that point. We actually would have to burn um, retrograde at the periapsis of our of our semi orbit of the moon for the this path to actually become a true orbit as opposed to us escaping it. But that's not our plan for today. That will be our plan for next episode. So we might want to burn right if we're planning on escaping in one direction, because what we do, if we burn to the right, we'd pass the moon to the right and then sort of slingshot around it that way, which would really send us into an orbit much higher from Kerbin from where we are now. Or if we pass it on the left, we'll end up on an orbit that going back kind of towards Kerbin. It'll still be a little higher and a little bit wonkier, but it won't be quite as crazy. Either way, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to go and decide to burn towards the left if I can. So for that, that's going to involve finding the circle with the arrows pointing out because effectively we're pointing, oops, go to stability assist mode because Jebediah was trying to hold us to retrograde. There we go. Pointing out because out of the orbit means towards the left here in this particular situation. So that looks good. So I'm going to point roughly that way and I'm going to start burning. And you see, I'm not using much fuel at all, but you see what's happening? This path here is going further to the left, further to the left, further to the left, and eventually it'll be deflected enough that we'll see a periapsis marker pop out of the moon. Keep waiting, keep waiting, there. So now we have a periapsis marker, which is 10,000 meters, 10 kilometers above the surface of the moon. And you can see what we're gonna do is we're gonna fly by here, and then we're gonna pop out this way, and we're gonna be leaving the moon's sphere of influence again. We're gonna be taken off from here, which is cool. Now, is 10,000 meters high enough well, if this were Kerbin, the answer would probably be no, because we'd be smacking into the air. We'd be smacking into the atmosphere, which would slow us down, which would cause things to occur. However, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. Therefore, we're not going to hit the air. The only question is, are we going to hit a mountain? Is it possible that we'd smack a mountain at this height? As it turns out, the tallest mountain on the moon is 7,000 meters. So we will definitely not hit a mountain. We're going to fly by the moon perfectly fine, and then at some point we'll exit here. Cool! Let's do some science. So, on our ship, I brought some science with me that I want to run. So let me just turn myself over here because it'll just look a little bit better if our door is facing up. So, I'm going to right-click on this new science junior. We will observe this material bay. Material bay gives us a lot more science than most of the other experiments. So there we go. So we got some science out of this, 50 science. And actually, we could technically come back here again and run this material study a second time for even more science. That sounds cool. If we did have an antenna, we could transmit it, but you can see we get very little of the science from transmitting. So this is an experiment you really want to bring home physically. Very much like the goo canister over here. So we're going to observe the mystery goo. Excellent. And we're going to go ahead and keep that experiment as well. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on our command pod, command module, and get a crew report and get some 10 science out of that. Very nice. We've got a couple more to do. We've got the press mat barometer, which I brought with me. 24 science. Lovely. And the, the temperature scan over here. That's great. Now, one thing you might have noticed, let me actually right click on one of those and, and review that. Each one of these experiments were performed in space high over the moon. There are, with all the experiments, there's multiple biomes, right? On, on Kerbin, we could do grasslands, we could do by the shore, we can do in the ocean, highlands, mountains. We could do low atmosphere, high atmosphere. Then there's a biome which is near the planet and another one that is high above the planet. The moon has the same thing. There's a biome that is high above the moon, which is where we are now, and there's another biome near the moon. In addition, there are many biomes on the moon. It's like highland, highlands, midlands, lowlands, craters, the poles, different things like that. And you can repeat the science experiments over and over and over as long as you're in a different biome each time. Which means, hey, we're going to be crossing near the moon. As long as, uh, I think it's 60 kilometers is the, uh, the, the break point between high space and near space for the moon. So as soon as you get within 60 kilometers, you can rerun all of these experiments. Ooh, that sounds lovely. The problem is this. Each experiment can only have data for one result at a time. If we try to run the, the thermometer again, we will be told we'd be overriding our previous scan. Okay, so this scan is overriding the old one. 
So if we were to try to do all the experiments again in near space, we'd be throwing away all of our high space experiments. And that, that's a little disappointing. So we could make a second trip out here to do these experiments again, but wouldn't it be great to get more science in one go? As it turns out, there's a way to do that, and there's actually a whole extra experiment we can run. But it's going to involve convincing Jebediah to step outside from the capsule and do an EVA. Now, we've done EVAs on the surface of Kerbin. We've gotten Jebediah to leave his capsule and walk around before. The problem is, if we try to hit that EVA button now, nothing happens. And the reason for that is, to be able to EVA anywhere other than the surface of Kerbin, you need to upgrade the astronaut complex. So let's do that now. Just going to quick save to make sure. Go to the Space Center. Our mission is going to keep flying towards the moon. That's totally okay. We got, we're still like hundred and, oh, a thousand, a thousand change. I think something like 1900 kilometers above the moon right now. It's going to take hours before we get to the moon. Of course, we'll be speeding up time. Here's our astronaut complex here. We, the astronaut complex is where you hire astronauts. That's not what we're looking to do right now. If you right click on any building, you can have the option to upgrade it. And it'll tell you what'll happen when you upgrade it. And you can see here, if we upgrade the astronaut complex, which only cost 75,000 Kerbal bucks, your Kerbals can perform EVAs. If for some reason you don't have enough money, complete more contracts. But if we do this, we can perform EVAs. And place flags, which will come in handy later when we land on things. So let's go ahead and pay for this upgrade. And then I can go back to the tracking station. I can select our moon or flyby Mark 1 again. And I can say I want to fly this. And now what we can do is Jebediah can EVA. He is now outside of the command pod. How exciting is that? This actually gets him more experience points as well, so it's a very good thing to do. We're going to right-click on Jebediah and ask him to do an EVA report. That's going to be worth a whole 16 more science. That's fantastic. But the real thing that he's out here to do, although that's still great, is we would like him to go and take the data out of these experiments so that they can be run again without overriding anything. So how are we going to do that? The experiments are on the back side of this capsule. We can't reach. If I try to right click, well, actually it turns out that I'll be able to do it. I didn't realize we'd be able to reach from here. That's surprisingly easy. So we can take the data. Now this press mat barometer is empty. Jebediah has got a copy of the science report. This thing is empty, therefore it can be run again. What about the thermometer? Apparently we can take that as well. Oh, okay. So we will go ahead and do that. Um, the, the goo canister, we can take the data, we can collect the data from this, but we'll get a warning about it. You cannot run a second experiment with the goo canister. The same thing applies to Material Bay. They are just one-shot deals. So while we can still remove the data, and Jeb Jebediah still has a copy of the data, we will not be able to run the goo canister a second time. A scientist, however, let's just, I'm just going to hit S to go down the ladder, even though it's up right now, but from Jebediah's point of view, S is going to move him down the ladder. If we right click on the science junior, I can collect the data. In here it does say that um, restoring the experiment requires a scientist. If Jebediah were a scientist instead of a pilot, he'd be able to reset these experiments completely so they could be reused. But then we wouldn't get to use his SAS ability. That's only something we've got because he's a pilot. So I'm going to remove that data. Now, in your ship design, it's entirely possible that you may not have been able to reach all the experiments like I was. I was actually surprised. I didn't think we'd be able to grab the ones out of the back. There is something you can do with that. Before you do this, do make sure to quick save. Oh, can't quick save while the Kerbal's on the ladder. Okay, I'm going to board, and we're going to ignore these messages for now. We're going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to quick save, then I'm going to EVA again. One of the things you can do when you can EVA, see, board, board is B, space is let go. We can let go. We can hit F again if we panic to grab, but if we let go, we're now floating. If I use WASD, nothing happens because Jebediah is just floating. He's not walking. He can't, he can't move really. However, Jebediah does have a jetpack. And if we turn on the jetpack, now we can do things. S moves us backwards, moves us backwards from the point of view of the camera. So S moves us backwards this way. W moves us forward. A moves us to the right or to the left. Sorry. D moves us to the right. And in addition to that, shift moves us up and control moves us down. Control down, shift up. Just like the throttle. Throttle up, throttle down. Well, here it's physically up and physically down. Always from the point of view of the camera. So for now, if I hit W, which is forward, you'll see he'll turn 
to face the camera and go forward. If I go this way and I hit W to go forward, he's going to turn and go in that direction. So the camera, you can use Q and E to twist around, but it, there's not much point to it. So I've gotten quite far away from the capsule here. How do I get back? Well, again, I'm going to face the capsule and hit W to start moving forward. I'm then going to go and tap some, I'm moving too far to the right, so I'm going to tap some A to go left. Tapping is by far the safest thing to do when you're eva would like this. Uh, I'm going to tap a little shift to start moving upwards. And of course, this is space, so we're going to keep going in that direction. So I'm going to keep going upward until we get a little bit more level, and then I'll probably stop the upward motion by tapping control. Excellent. I'm going to move left a little bit more, let that drift that way until I'm lined up with my ship. The ship which started to tumble a little bit when we eva but that's pretty normal. So I'm going to get ready to tap D. There we go. Now, mostly still going forward. Now, if you smack into the capsule too hard, you can actually do some damage, but we just gently bumped into it. That's fine. So we've, we're physically there. It's great. Now, if your experiments couldn't be reached, you can do the work from here. If you right click on this, notice if we're further away, we don't get all the controls. But as we get close again, the controls will pop up. There it is. So that we can do things like, hey, let's close the door. Excellent. And we could have collected data this way. So you can collect all your data while being EVA'd like this, and it's a heck of a lot of fun. You do have a limit to how much fuel you've got, but it does last fairly long. Especially, you don't have to burn continuously. You just have to tap and then let it drift in the right direction. So I'm going to try to find my way to the door over here. Um, life's a lot easier if the door is sort of facing, like, generally upwards. It sucks when it's sort of underneath and then you're trying to reach, but I'm just going to gently drift towards here. And there it is. When you get close, you can hit F to grab. This will take practice. You will you will have a hard time with the EVA sort of like movement the first several times. Just make sure you quick save before you leave the pod, just in case something terrible happens. But after that, it actually becomes very fun to fly around in space. Okay, so here's the thing. We have now cleared these experiments so they can run again. With one exception, the crew report in here you can think of the crew report as a survey or, you know, some, some form that Jebediah had to fill up that's part of a clipboard that's attached to his command chair. And he's already filled out one crew report. If he tries to fill out a second crew report, he's just going to overwrite the one he had before. So the crew report is the one experiment we can't run a second time right now. But there's something we can do about that. Just like with the other experiments, if I right click on the command pod, I can take data from here. You'll see it's got six data because all the data that we grabbed from all the other experiments, we stored in a command pod. So we're going to take six things out. That's going to include the crew report. And then when we store this data again, either by hitting this button or by simply boarding, when we board, it stores everything. We're actually storing it somewhere else. I, I always think of it as you're storing it underneath his chair. Therefore, Jebediah's clipboard is now empty and he can do a brand new crew report. So what we've gone and done now is we've reset every single one of our experiments so everything can be run a second time, except for the material bay and goo canister because they're one-shot deals unless you have a scientist. That's great. So I think now what we're, we're ready to do is we're ready to wait until we're in low space, near space of the moon. So I'm going to quick save again because we're going to do a time warp. And I'm just going to accelerate. We're going to try to get to within 60 kilometers. Right now, these are in kilometers. When we get a little closer and this number shrinks, it'll turn to meters. And whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Always stop your time warp a little early. That's why we quick save before we time warp too, because it's easy to overshoot. Times 50. So we're just waiting this to turn to 60. At some point, the camera changes. And there. The second it's 60... We're now in near space. If you're not sure, what you can do is you can keep running the experiment. You can say crew report, and if it says in space, high above the moon, you can say, oh, no, I'll just reset it and wait. And then you try again later. Nope, it still says high above the moon, reset it and go. And then at some point, it'll turn into space near the moon like this. And this is a whole new set of sciences. So we're going to go ahead and keep this experiment. We're going to run the press mat again, log that pressure data. And by the way, take a moment to enjoy the fact that, Jesus, that's the moon. That's crazy. We're going to log the thermometer. Excellent. So we've done, we did the crew report, right? Yeah, we did crew report, press mat, thermometer. We cannot do the material bay and we can't do the goo canister again. What we can do again though is do an EVA. And we can get a new EVA report. Now what's interesting is the EVA report is unique in that it's not near the moon. It's above a certain biome. This is above the highlands. 
And if we wait until later, we might be over the Midlands or the Lowlands or over a named crater, which means you can actually do EVAs multiple times as you're flying above here, but you might not know like where you are. Um, in your default mode, you don't know what biome you're over, but we can just EVA again and then do the same thing where we just, uh, we're gonna click, where are we? Nope, Highlands, so we'll wait. Uh, I think we're drifting a little up the ladder here. Let's make sure we're attached properly. And then, you know, you're gonna wait a little bit more. Nope, still Highlands. Okay, well, let's board. We're gonna let time go by over here and try again. All right, let's try it now. Any chance we're over something different? It might not. Ah, Moon's East Far Side Crater. Completely different set of science. Bonus. So you can keep doing that to get more and more science. Now, if you wanted to enter into orbit around the Moon, what would you do? Well, of course, at this point, we're looking to make an orbit. You have to have a circle that's going on, right? We don't have a circle. We have this arc thing. And the one way you can think of it is effectively your apoapsis is kind of like infinitely far away. It's not actually true. There, there would be some apoapsis there, but we're not going to we're not going to reach it before we leave the sphere of influence of the moon. So what we would have to do is we would have to burn retrograde at a periapsis. You have to lower this sort of infinite apoapsis. You have to lower it to where it's no longer going to escape and we now form a circle or rather an ellipse around the moon. And you know what? Just for the sake of fun, there's there's no reason to do this. No reason to do this, but just for the sake of, you know, having a learning moment, we're going to turn ourselves retrograde here because I have lots of fuel um, for different values of lots. I have some fuel. Maybe I won't take the risk, but I was going to say, if I burn retrograde here, what you'll see is at some point, these, these two prongs over here will sort of close together and then all of a sudden, whoop, close the loop. And the second that happens, you'll be in an orbit around the moon. A pretty eccentric one, but you would be in one. And then if I turned around and burned prograde to raise the apoapsis again, because the apoapsis would then form over here. As soon as this loop closed, we'd have an apoapsis. If I turn around and, and burn prograde to raise the apoapsis, it would, boop, it would break into these two prongs again. I don't have infinite fuel, so let's be careful. I don't really need much to return, but let's not take any risks over here. So we're going to accept the fact that we're just going to fly by the moon over here. How lovely. So you could pop in and out a few more times to do EVAs. There, let me let me fast forward. I'll do, this is, we're about to hit our lowest point right over here. Tell you what, we'll do one at our lowest point, just, just out of curiosity. What are we hovering over? Oh, Midlands! Hey, we are getting new science. Well, that's a bonus. And then I'm just going to time warp, and right before we hit 60, and we are going to leave the near space, I'll do one more, just on the off chance. Oh, the sunrise is lovely. Let's be quick because I'm about to leave. EVA report. No, still Midlands. So if I keep this experiment, when I'm bored, it's going to warrant... Oh, Midland Craters! Oh, I did get an extra one. Nice. So I did get an extra one. That is really lucky. I was going to say, if it had just been Midlands and I had a duplicate, when I boarded here, it would have told me, this is a duplicate, you're going to have to throw one away. And then you just say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll throw away one of the copies because there's no point in having two copies of the same thing. Anyway, that's it. We are now in space high above the moon once more. And we're just going to let ourselves drift back to Kerbin. Now, one of the things to note is I did bring this battery pack. And why is that? Well, your command pod ships with 50 units of electricity. That is probably enough. But if we go ahead and click on the resources over here, right? This little resource things and you see the electric charge. I have 150 because I have a battery pack on here that adds an extra 100. When you use your reaction wheels to turn, you can see you use electric charge. You see that? It's got some number. As I try to turn and turn on the SAS, you can see it, it uses electric charge to do these maneuvers. It is entirely possible that through your maneuvering, you might run out of electric charge, at which point you will no longer be able to steer your ship. This might be a bad thing, depending on the state of your situation. And so I brought the battery pack just to make sure I had enough. Later on, we'll be able to unlock solar panels, and then we really won't have to worry too much about power at all. But at this point, all we have to do is wait until we leave the sphere of influence of the moon. There's nothing left for us to do here. So I'm going to go ahead and do some time warping. And at some point, real here soon, very soon, get ready to stop. Oh, there it is. Stop, 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 stop. We have left the sphere of influence of the moon. We are back in the sphere of influence of Kerbin. Kerbin's the most important gravitational body right now. And you can see we have a very interesting orbit around Kerbin right now. The lowest point of our orbit is 6.7 million meters, and the highest point is 
30 million meters. We have been slingshotted into quite a higher orbit. And this is the sort of thing that's going to happen. If we had gone around the moon on the right-hand side and left on the left, we'd be in even higher orbit. I think our periapsis might be a little closer to Kerbin, but our apoapsis would be really high, probably past Minmus, in fact. Um, depending on which side of the moon you approach the moon on, it'll also affect this slingshot effect. Uh, and it's a force that you can use for really interesting things later on um, when you get maneuver nodes. But for now, it's like, okay, here's the situation. We need to get back to Kerbin. How do we do that? Well, we need some part of our orbit to touch the atmosphere, which will cause us to hit the air and slow down, and that will cause us to land eventually. So we need to drop one side of our orbit down to that point. The best place to do that, the best thing to drop, will be the point of our orbit that's already the lowest. If we have to lower some part of our orbit, we may as well lower the, the lowest part which is the periapsis. That will be much more fuel efficient. If we were to burn now, we would be lowering this area over here. And the distance from here to Kerbin is a lot more than the distance from here to Kerbin. So to be most fuel efficient, we want to lower the lowest part. And to do that, we have to burn retrograde at the opposite side of our orbit, which of course will be our apoapsis. So if we burn retrograde at apoapsis, we lower our periapsis, which is the most fuel efficient way to do it. So we're gonna do a quick save and a really big time warp. Actually, you know what we can do? We can do another EVA. We are going to do an EVA in space high above... Oops, it's over here. Space high above Kerbin. Because we haven't done that before. That's EVA. Excellent. The other thing I bet is... I bet we haven't done a crew report high above Kerbin. Now, if we try to run a crew report now, we'll be told, Hey, there's already a crew report. Right, we have to empty our clipboard. And because of reasons right now, we have to EVA grab all the data, and then we can board, or store data, either way, it's the same thing. We can board, and then our clipboard is empty, so we can take a crew report high above Kerbin, because we've never done that, at least I haven't. So we're gonna keep that experiment. How lovely is that? Okay. Um, in fact, I'm willing to bet we haven't done the press mat or the temperature either. So let me EVA one more time. We're gonna go and take the data from the press mat. I'm gonna take the data from the thermometer. I'm gonna board again. Because that's probably true. Log temperature? Yeah, fresh science. Lovely. Press mat? Fresh science. Really good. Okay. All right. So again, I'm going to quick save. And I'm, oops, and I'm going to let time warp go by until we're at the, par the apoapsis. Or, you know, fairly near the apoapsis. You know, when we're talking about distances this far, it really is like the difference of like 0.01% more or less fuel if you're like right on or not. So don't stress too much. That I'm going to call that pretty darn close. Okay. So if we burn now, we're going to lower the periapsis. So we're going to burn retrograde that marker over there to lower the apoapsis or the periapsis. I'm going to right click on the peri so that the numbers stay there. And as usual, I'm going to try to drop it to about... Um, Somewhere between 20 and 30 tends to be a nice, convenient spot for it. Tends to work out pretty well. This will shrink pretty fast as you get a little closer here. So, I'm going to use just one tick of shift to lower it a little bit slower, maybe a little bit more shift. Now, I'm going to try to get it right on 25, and you're going to find that that's not really possible with... See, I have these old man reflexes. I, I overshot. Oh, let's turn prograde to raise this up. And I'm going to use one tip, tick of shift and then hit X and, oh, oh, I went, I went too far, oh no. I'm exact, I'm, you know, I could have stopped there, but let's say it's proving to be way too difficult to end up exactly where I want. Because even with just one tick of shift, it's too hard and too fast. Well, there's a solution to this. If we go back to our spaceship and we right click on our engine, I can tune the engine down. This is the thrust limiter. I can bring the engine down to say, I don't know, some number, some low number. I'm trying to get to 5%, but it's being difficult. doesn't matter, 5.5%. This means if I set my throttle to 100% over here, I'm actually only going to be using 5.5% of the engine. Which means if I just give one tick of shift to get one notch of throttle, I'm going to be accelerating very slowly, which sounds pretty convenient. So I'm going to go back to the map. I'm going to right-click on the periapsis to leave it up. It's too high right now, so I'm going to turn retrograde. And I'm going to use one tap of shift which will slowly lower this down. Much more comfortable. Again, not a big deal here. I'm just using this to demonstrate an interesting technique. Okay, well, that's pretty good. So our periapsis is at 25 kilometers, which is going to be a nice, good re-entry, I think. 
I could, at this point, dump this stage. Because I don't need an engine or fuel anymore. I'm going to keep it just because it's not going to happen here. But it might be possible on our return here, depending on where the moon is, it's entirely conceivable that we might accidentally encounter the moon on the way back and need to do some more maneuvering. It's not going to be a thing, but I'm going to keep my, my fuel for now. So again, I'm going to quick save on a time warp. This, we're going to go, because we're falling towards Kerbin and get pulled by gravity, we're going to go faster and faster. You know what? We're getting awfully close to this moon. Is there any chance... That would be really funny. Is it possible? I think we're just going to scooch by without entering its sphere of influence. But be ready to stop the time warp. Oh, 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 oh! Technically, we're in the sphere of influence of the moon. Now, we're far enough away that this is our path. Our path is mostly going to be straight. But not literally. We are being curved ever so slightly by the moon, which means when we pop out the other side, we're going to be on a slightly different path. In fact, we're going to be on a path that doesn't have a periapsis. This means that our, our path is going to go and hit the planet. Now, this might be fine, okay? The downside to this, because we're still going to hit the air first, which is going to slow us down. The difference is we're going to, there's not going to be as much air between us and the ground. Whereas if the periapsis is at, again, that 25k mark, it means we're coming in very sideways, which means there's going to be more air between us and the ground and more opportunity to slow down. So let's go ahead and see if we can improve this. Now, if I were to burn prograde here, what I'd actually be doing is raising this orbit this side of the orbit over here and pushing it up. So that, if I burn prograde here, it's not really going to help us raise the periapsis from like a negative number to something that's actually helpful. So just as with the moon, what we're going to do is burn radial, and that's to say outward from our orbit, in this case towards the right. We're going to try to shove this line towards the right, um, which should cause us to no longer hit the planet directly. So I'm going to go to stability mode, I'm going to find the blue circle with the outward arrow. We don't want to burn into our orbit, we want to burn out of our orbit, so we're looking for the out of one, out of circle one, this one over here, and we're going to try to burn in that direction to shove this route further to the right so that we don't hit it as much. Again, ideally, the best place to correct this would actually be if we were at the apoapsis, we would burn prograde to raise the periapsis. That would be the most fuel efficient solution. However, we don't have that option anymore. So instead, we're just going to try to roughly shove our orbit to the right. It's not as fuel efficient, but it's what we need to do, and it's probably going to be fine. Keep in mind, my engine is still down derated to like 5% strength, so it's going to be a pretty slow maneuver. If I go to full throttle, yeah, almost nothing is changing. So let's go ahead and... Uh, get you all the way up to 100% and go. There it is. We've got a periapsis again. Oh, it actually popped up quite a lot faster than I expected. Um, so it turned out to not need a whole lot of fuel to fix this. Thank goodness. Of course, it makes sense. The moon didn't change our orbit that much. It probably just dropped our orbit by something like 30 kilometers, which is nothing but was enough to put it inside the ground. So I'm just going to burn um, the opposite, I don't know, anti-radial probably over here, burn inward, just a tiny scooch just to get the periapsis. There we go. Again, sort of that sweet spot. So now that there's no moon in our way, we know we're not going to get deflected by anything weird. I'm so happy that happened because it was a great, a good teaching moment, right? So we know we're fine here. So at this point, I'm going to say, all right, goodbye to the stage. I've made sure to collect the science out of this, which is good because it's not coming home with us. Excellent. Whee! Fun camera change there. Interesting. So all I'm going to do now is quick save again because we're going to do a big time warp until we re-enter the atmosphere. Now, one of the things, if we time warp too fast, because of the way the calculations happen in Kerbal, if we time warp too fast, it's possible that Kerbal will start sort of processing things in chunks. So it'll get us to here and then go to this chunk. And it'll if we go too fast, it's possible that Kerbal will miss the fact that we're supposed to hit the atmosphere at some point. Also, it turns out that decoupling from that ship this far away, because that doing that separator does give you a little bit of a boost to both parts. There's a little bit of a, a tiny explosion to separate the parts. And since we're so far away that even that tiny explosion was enough to knock us off course by 10 kilometers, that's okay. It's not going to hurt us too badly, but if you want to avoid that, do your separation closer, because then um, it, we're so close that the tiny explosion will only um, affect our path a tiny bit. We're still fine here. So, you want to be careful and not to time warp too fast. Or, you know, you can time warp to a thousand and then be ready to slow it down around here. 
There we go. This is going to be okay. And what's going to happen, as always, is when we enter the atmosphere, the time warp will automatically cancel, as long as you don't enter too fast. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure, as usual, our heat shield is coming in first. I'm going to do that by encouraging Jebediah to hold retrograde for me. Again, this shape is stable enough that um, it should hold it there. Um, some of our bits and bobs, there we go. Let's go sideways. The, the little side bits were heating up, and it's possible that they explode. Most likely, they wouldn't destroy your capsule, but let's do that. This heat meter is fine. I think it's the capsule itself that's just warming up a tiny bit, but not actually being a problem. Uh, at this point, we can turn off the SAS because this shape is dynamically stable. Although, what the heck? Let's ask Jebediah to make sure we keep facing uh, retrograde because it's perfectly fine. This will use a little bit of electricity, but not much to do that. And all we're waiting for is for our parachute to be safely deployable. Look at the sunrise as we come home. Isn't that glorious? We've been coming in pretty equatorial, which is kind of amazing. It doesn't have to be for this situation. So yeah, we got one heat meter. That's what that's what this is. And if we had turned before, yeah. Oh. Okay, we're fine. We're fine. But yeah, um, if because these parts are sticking out, if they dangle too far in in certain directions, they could get some heat exposure. So what actually happened there is that goo canister exploded. Luckily, we had removed the science from the goo canister, and it's safely stored inside of the pod. It means we won't get the money from bringing that home. But we haven't lost anything, and nothing exploded. So yeah, don't don't do what I just did. That was an, that was a, another teachable moment. I was trying to show the heat meter. I was hoping it would ri raise, but not necessarily explode. But there you go. Sometimes those explosions could take out the rest of your ship too, and that would be what we could consider to be a bad thing. Come down on a very mountainous region over here. Um, we might be able to get a crew report. Oh, we got a crew report inside. Damn. We can fix that in a second. Now, right now, if we were to EVA. Right now, we're traveling so fast that the wind would rip Jebediah off the capsule, and that would be, again, a bad thing. But our parachute can now be deployed, which is great. I can turn off the SAS at this point, definitely. And once the speed drops down enough, I'm just going to do a little physics warping to accelerate things. Once the speed drops out enough, we can actually EVA quite safely, especially if we wait until our parachute fully deploys, which will happen, again, about 1,000 meters above the surface of the ground. And then once we're falling at a gentle pace of, say, 6 meters per second, it's going to be perfectly fine for Jebediah to do an EVA at that point. So let's see if we can sneak that in there. Okay, parachute's fully deploying, slowing us down. What happened? 400 meters. I'm thinking, you know, I keep saying that the parachute fully deploys 1,000 meters. I'm going to reload to my last quick save. I, I think they may have changed things. It used to be 1,000 meters above ground level, but I'm worried that now... It's not above ground level. Let's go ahead and get it fully deployed sooner. Uh, no, I know what's going on. It's because of my mods. I think we might be stuck here in this video, and it has nothing to do with, with Kerbal Space Program itself. When I'm playing on my own, I run with the real shoots mod. And the real shoots mod, yeah, changes the uh, the mechanics of your parachutes, um, and 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 changes all the math behind them. And I thought I had gone and disabled my mods properly, but it does a weird thing. It sort of stickies some changes to your parachute. And so even though it's fully deployed, and in fact it's definitely deployed in time because we're this is about 400 meters, and we don't have a very heavy can, um, a tin can going on over here. This thing should stop. In your game, this should stop. Parachute is, is fully deployed with lots of time before the ground, but you can see it's not actually slowing us down. It's not slowing us down. And uh, that's a side effect. Unless there's something I'm missing here, it's possible I'm doing something wrong, but almost 100% it's um, a side effect of turning the real shoots mod on and off. And so this parachute is not going to function for me. And that's a darn shame. What a terrible way to end this tutorial. I'm 100% I'm convinced that it should work perfectly fine for you. It's just not working for me. And Jebdai is going to die every time. Now, there is a possibility. If I go and EVA with Jebdai, triples are surprisingly sturdy. They are surprisingly sturdy. 
you'd be surprised. Again, yeah. It's like, it should be fully open. Fully deployed. Alright, Jebdai, you got this. Sometimes this works. <laughs> That's right, Kerbals are tougher than spaceships. It's kind of, it's literally true. So, um, he's got no spaceship, and I did lose all that science, unfortunately. And I'm pretty sure it's a side effect of the mod. I might be wrong. Uh, maybe we'll discover something and there'll be an explanation in comments. But I've seen that before. As I swap real parachutes on and off, bizarre things happen where your parachutes just no longer work anymore. Um, but hey, Jibidai seems fine with it. Again, we lost all of our science. Uh, I can plant a flag, though. <laughs> you can plant flags once you upgrade your science center. Um... So, Jebediah's Bounce is going to be the name of this site. Um, Kerbals are tougher than spaceships. Boom. There you go. Ta-da! And of course, make sure to uh, take a screenshot. F2 to hide the user interface. F1 to screenshot. Lovely. And uh, I guess they can take an EVA report from the deserts over here. Excellent and uh, I can be recovered. <laughs> Jebediah didn't die. Good news, everyone. I told Steam to uh, verify all the uh, the files in the game, and it found one file that needed to be re-downloaded and fixed up, and look at that! Our mission is saved! I just reloaded from the quick save, and the exact same situation. This is where we were before, but suddenly, the parachute actually works. So what I want to say is this. Hey, we can EVA Jebediah over here. We can go and take all the data out and restore it. That way we'll be able to run another crew report. We can do an EVA report, flying over Kerbin's Desert for some more science. We can board once more, and we can run a new crew report of flying over Kerbin's Desert. And we get to save all of our science. I'm so happy. Oh, man. Yeah, I was like, what? did I do something wrong? Nope, just Ker uh, somewhere, somewhere one of the files in Kerbal got confused. I, I don't think it was even the mod, because it was one of the, the core files. Anyway, I don't know. Something clearly changed one of the files somewhere along the way. So, um, I just, on Steam, you can right-click on the, on your game. If you ever run into this, right-click on your ga game, choose Properties, then go to the Local Files tab, and click the button that says Verify Integrity of Game Files. And suddenly, everything's gonna work A-OK. -okay. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and be impatient at this point and say, man, we're not landing fast enough. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, do I want to dump this just to land faster? Or to land slower? No, our speed's fine. See, now now I'm annoyed that I, I deployed the parachute so early, because clearly we're well above the ground. Anyway, we're obviously going to land and be safe now, so don't worry. Everything's okay, and we're going to be able to follow from this point now that it fixed the, uh, the technical problem with Kerbal Space Program. See you next time.